This week on Barbell Shrug, we interview Steve Liberati of Steve's Club and Rob Miller. He happened to judge Rich Froning at the games once. And uh, today we're going to go paleo. I'm going to catch this guy. I run out of to do. Pairs, Perfect of, pairs of three. Should I try, a new, tracking? Should I try a, a New Jersey <laughs> accent here? No. Yeah, Probably not. It. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. You only stand to offend people. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bletzer here with Chris Moore and Doug Larson, CTP behind the camera here. And we're in New Jersey mm. with Steve La Liberati of Steve's Club and Rob Miller, longtime affiliate owner and uh, level one staff dude. And uh, he judges Rich Froning. <laughs> Not good enough, Rich. <laughs> Again. As a, as a hobby. Yes. As a, your hobby is to judge Rich Froning. <laughs> Very critical of Rich. Rob is. <laughs> yes. Today we're going to attempt to talk about performance tracking and how you should probably do it and how it might benefit <laughs> your training and all that kind of stuff. Before we get any further, go to barbellshrug.com. Sign up for the newsletter. What are they going to get if they sign up for the newsletter, Chris? Uh, all their wishes come true. All and, your and a virtual hug. In a virtual hug, I'll send it to you promptly. There you'll you go. tingle all over. You'll know you got it. <laughs> all right, Steve, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and Steve's Club and all, all that good stuff? Sure. Even Hello. though you hate it, man. Even though you yeah, hate talking he, about it. He said he hates talking about himself, but we're going to make him do it anyway. It's you said humble. I have about an hour to talk about myself? An hour. You know. Okay. Hour and ten. <laughs> Three, two, one, go. <laughs> um, so I, I started Steve's Club in Camden, New Jersey, get kids off the street. And from there, we started Steve's Paleo Goods. So we started a line of beef jerky, nuts and berries. It's called the Paleo Kit. That helps support our nonprofit. Uh, we also have, from there, we started Steve's Club National Program. So we spread the concept to other cities. Um, we now have 19 clubs um, in cities all over the country. So very, very excited oh, cool. to be part of that. We used to eat those Paleo Kits by the bucket. We used to buy like huge buckets of them. Yeah. Really? Oh, well, thank we you. We tend yeah. to overdo things. <laughs> like, we ate nothing but Paleo <laughs> Kits for a while, and then we're like, oh, we can't do this anymore. Yeah, I've, actually, little, I haven't little, had one in a while. Little but. note, don't just eat only Paleo <laughs> Kits. You gotta like, you gotta work them into your normal diet. Every once in a while, I gotta throw in a stalk of broccoli. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the best bit is the... When, when, I, when I went to Africa, I took 30 with me. Oh, wow. It lasted me for like two oh, weeks. Wow. The best parts of the bottom, the jerky and the strawberry gel that forms, like yeah. it's a salty, <laughs> sweet perfection thing. So is this zone proportioned? It is, yes. Okay, so it it's is. paleo zone. I didn't know people use the word the could term you, zone anymore. Yeah, could you mix those we, two we things? We try not to. <laughs> are, you allowed, are you allowed legally to say paleo and zone? Don't they, aren't they uh, too legally diametrically sure. opposed? <laughs> well, the two gangs. I don't think they trademarked the word zone. That's, right. why, that's why Steve's not saying it. He's letting Mike say it. <laughs> yeah, the two exactly. likely don't get along. I, I can say whatever I want. Rob, <laughs> that's what I think anyway. Uh, can you give us a little background on you and, uh, you know, CrossFit, what, six years now? CrossFit yeah, Level 1 staff? Yep, yeah, uh, coming about six years. Yeah, so I've been doing that for a while. Traveling around. Most of the time it's local, but I got, I've gone to some cool places with that. It's been a lot of fun. It's, um, it's really cool to be part of that experience with new people when they're coming through, so I really enjoy that. Um, I run CrossFit Delaware Valley. We've had that since the summer of 2007. And that was one of the, you know, typical kind of lo-fi CrossFit experiences. It started in a garage and- Early on too, right? Yeah, real early. What would you say you the got, number of your first- number what? Yeah, what was it, number? It was, I think it was 186. I could be wrong. And my was, what what month was that? It was, uh, I, I, the, I came online, my, my site was listed July 4th, 2007. July, we were November. Or end of September, I think is when we- we oh, moved into our space in November. Oh, okay. I, I'm not exactly sure. Sometime between September and November, we came on the website. So we're, we're, we're real close. And you too, Steve. 200-ish? 
You, you came online in 2007? This is all new to me. I never heard anybody saying 186. I thought it's <laughs> it's the top 10 and that's cool and it passed that. I think we're 101. Oh, you're keeping I mean, it cool, I think man. About it. I'm just kidding. No, yeah, we started it. I started at Steve's Club in about 2006 and then about two years later, I started CrossFit Tribe in a park. So about the same time as you guys. It's also cool. a time when it was very... I won't say overly risky, but no one understood what this would become. That's that's the wilderness well, days. The, the hard the, part, yeah. the, the wild hard wild part west. Is explaining it to people when you run into them at the bar and you're trying to, get, you know, that's where we did most <laughs> of our recruiting because we were in yeah. college. <laughs> so I was in college and like, oh, I got this gym where we do, uh, you know, we do like weightlifting and like, you know, some track type stuff and some rowing. <laughs> yeah. And people were like, what the, what the fuck, fuck, are, you yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? That, that was, that's how it was back then, right? Totally. How'd you get people in the gym? I, I mean, usually, we, yeah, I usually say what we don't do. It's not bodybuilding. Okay, now. Then what is it? Yeah, then what is it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah all you new affiliates, you don't know how hard it was. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everything's handed to you on a silver platter now. Yeah, back, back then, if you told your friends and family, oh, I'm going to open up a gym, they go, why are you, you want to fail and be a financial <laughs> ruin? You want to try to compete with a gold gym on that model? That's the only option you had. Then it's changed everything. Oh, uh, yeah. You're a rebel without a cause, right? I love that title. <laughs> so, Rob, at the beginning of the show, he said that you... You judge Rich Froning, but you're actually a judge for Rich Froning in competition. Is why we said that. Yeah, you're not yeah. in your underwear well, at home the, judging the story him. there at, at the games. <laughs> no, at I, the games. I, I got a couple of marquee athletes over the years. I've done four the past four years at the games, um, and I've done some you know similar time at, at regionals. Um, and I got rich in one lane one time. Um, it was I can't remember the workout. What's you that? can't remember the workout? No, I know the workout. I know what it was called because they all have names now. You know, like right. the Cinco's and, but uh, it was <laughs> too many fucking names, by the way. Too many names. It was uh-huh. the one where at the end of the tennis court they had to do the burpees into the muscle ups. I just remember that piece. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, he just demolished the thing. Yeah. And he, you know, Made it easy at the on time. You. Oh, he did. It. He makes it real easy. I mean, some of, you know, as the levels go up, you start to see more and more of sort of virtuosity of movement. And yeah. even Rich and I, I can't say enough about the other athletes because they'll, you know. Fantastic athletes, but mm-hmm. he is far and away. I mean, the way the guy moves, it's just. So you never had a no rep, Rich, and him give you a dirty look or anything? No, never like, had. Fuck a no me, rep. Rich. I'm sorry, bro. I've that <laughs> Here, have it back. Yeah, you get that a lot at the regionals. The regionals, you know, you oh, get, sure. you'll I'll get bet. some it is, passionate people. But the, it is uh, funny when we say he judged Rich Froning. What people think of is some guy in his underwear at home on the internet, like going, "I could fucking do this shit. Yeah. If I if I had to work all the time, I could do this shit." <laughs> Not true. <laughs> we're looking, we're looking at you. Dumb silent. I had this question and then I forgot it. And I was like, shit, what is it? It was something about. I was hoping one of you guys track, would happen while I remember. It was something about tracking athletes we were going to talk about. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> we want to talk about how important it is to the track performance. And you guys have coached athletes. You've run gyms. You've had uh, a lot of people come through. And then a lot of people, don't, I think they just show up and they don't worry about tracking their performance. Yeah. And then sometimes they don't feel like they're getting results, but they don't even know why or if they are or not. You come in, you give a magical amount of force, you kind of you do work, and you get something magical in return, and you don't really know where it came from sometimes <laughs> if you're not measuring shit. I said the, the thing you're not measuring is the thing you don't know if, how to improve. Yeah. That's where it starts, right? Uh, so, you know, Rob, what, what, do you, what do you guys do in regard to, like, getting your clients to track performance and how much emphasis is put there? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I mean, for me, it's just a big separator between the people that are that are more serious and those that are not. And not to put down the people that aren't serious if they're just coming for a workout and mm-hmm. they want to be fit and just have that general fitness. You know, the workouts are really powerful. I mean, they're going to get a really great, uh, really great response. But the people who come in and they say, I have a specific goal. You know, the goal has to be linked to, you know, what is your, what is your measurement system? What's your currency? And so those are the people that have the log books. Those are the people that um, use tools that we have in the gym, like Wattify, in order to, you know, to make that experience, you know, richer and better. And, and they're looking at it in terms of baby steps and trying to get to new milestones and, and push themselves in that way. So, you know, ideally, I'd want everybody on that. You know, I acknowledge the fact that CrossFit has taken on, you know, kind of that regular role for some people. It's not necessarily all those fringe athletes anymore mm-hmm. that would show up with logbooks we're comfortable in that environment but uh we always try and push them that way you know we're like hey the, you know when they come in for the intro we're like that's where you keep your logbook and we point that you know that cubby hole out and we're like this is how wattify works and we do try to do a good job of that yeah well, i mean with wattify though you get pretty good i know we started using it in our facility recently and you get pretty good results on people logging stuff that way because it's so community driven yep as opposed to just a logbook that's one of those things where I think if you're yeah. using an 
app or something that's a little more intuitive. Yeah. Like for me, I have a hard time more with recording the times. It, but if but if it's something that's gonna be easy to look up later, yeah, for sure. Going back in a logbook to see what I did on for, back squat for all my years of powerlifting, man. I I used to scribble that shit down and like piece of notebook paper in my gym bag or like a, a lab book I had from our, our old laboratory or, you know, uh, you try to keep an Excel spreadsheet and the tool was never quite what you needed to actually, unless you were really geeking out and tracking every variable, which was never me, never too detail oriented. I didn't have a user friendly tool to help me keep track of it, like a digital coach in my yeah. pocket now that everybody has now this access to. Yeah, yeah the technology has been great. I mean, Wattify, we use it at our gym. We love it. Uh, members love it. It definitely helps. It gives you a goal. You know, you go up there before your workout. You look at what you did before. So it kind of it gives that goal. Whereas before, we were just talking and writing it down on a piece of paper. I know I did that for years. Or and, memory, um, which memory. is always sure yeah. shot, you know. But I think there is a lot of value of just put, whether putting it on paper, having it on a, tracking it on a screen. You know, kind of just puts it out there. It says, this is what I did in the past, and this is what I'm trying to beat. Yeah. So I'm a huge fan of it. I mean, I think it, like Rob said, it depends on the goals. Some members just go by based on feel. Their intuition, they feel good. They got a good sweat. They feel like they're working out. So that's required sometimes, sometimes man. Yeah, get in really and get a little pumped. But for a lot of athletes, they want to know that, they're, that it's working, that it, they're measuring yeah. it and it's effective. And sometimes you can't go home in the mirror and look at your tricep and say, I think it's, it looks... My abs are Maybe not you, but Some boy, people after, can. after well, a vicious <laughs> close grip bench session, I can see the differences. But there's a, it's, it's, there's a lot. Of, it's <laughs> deceiving, right? Yeah, Sometimes. yeah, it's all bullshit. Yeah, yeah as bullshit. a coach, I really like the whole logging of results because yeah. a lot of times people go, oh, I'm not getting the results. I remember this a while back. We, we offered twice a week training as an option, which yeah. I'm very opposed to now. And you'll understand why in a second. But people would come to me who were paying for to come into the gym twice a week. And I had other people that were unlimited. They would come in five days a week. Yeah. And these people would come in the gym and go, I'm, I'm just not getting the results. I know they're split and they're doing a boot camp or something somewhere else. I'm just not getting the results that, you know, I feel like I should be getting. I'm like, I'm like oh, okay, well, how often do you come to the gym? They go, oh, well, twice a week. I'm a twice a week member. I'm like, oh, you're getting twice a week results. And, exactly. yeah. and they go, oh. And <laughs> oh, it's like, well. like you should upgrade <laughs> to this more expensive plan. <laughs> no, but I mean that's really the numbers the, don't lie. That's really the truth. But that's where logging can be like really valuable. And like uh, I think as as a gym owner, like logging attendance can so be you think it gives not, you not not just like the performance in the gym, but yeah. logging like how many times do you think you're showing up, and how many times are you really showing up? How many times have people filled out diet logs and then realize they didn't eat a Snickers bar every day at three o'clock? <laughs> Well, I think whether you're a business owner, a marketer, whether you're an athlete, you have to measure it. You have to measure it to see how it's working and see how you can improve. I mean, it's just simply looking at data. You can't go by just feel. I, mean, I think there's two perspectives, really. There's the athlete perspective where you don't know if things are moving the way they should unless you're measuring. Because if you leave it to your flawed perception, you're going to get shit wrong. Doug, how, how often times am I wrong with my flawed perception? I mean, self-deprecating. Every time, every time. But to Mike's, every time. Every, <laughs> every this, time. This, <laughs> Doug's like, this guy's got the fattest mouth on the team. <laughs> Mike made a good point about how also if you're the coach on the other end and you have somebody who's not happy with you and what you got, this gives you objective numbers, transparency, right. something to fall back on. Say, no, look, look, man. I mean, here it is. You entered this, right? Yes, I did. You eat snicker bar every day at two o'clock and a liter of diet Pepsi or regular Pepsi? Yeah, I didn't think it was a problem. It is, or you didn't show up X weeks in a row. Maybe that could be why you don't get the results. Exactly. It's, it's not just you trying to, it feels like otherwise you're trying to sell something to somebody, but you and have the numbers. The, and then the entire the other component of putting it on the board. So as CrossFit, I think Greg Glassman originally used the same men die for points. Yeah. You put it on the whiteboard and there's something to be had about ranking. So oh, yeah. people yeah. like to see how they stack up, how they compare to other athletes. Oh yeah, we got the morning crew like, <laughs> don't even mess with the evening crew sometimes. I think they put up like some fake results. <laughs> just to These motivate, maniacs. just to motivate sure. the PM crew. Sure. Like, it's great, I love it. I we love seeing it. That's the other day. That's a whole other good topic because like there's the thing that, there's the workout program and then there's these elements that are just as important that are hard to pin down. Yeah. And then you could be a dental hygienist or office guy, you come in and go, that guy beat me. Fuck that guy. You're here in your head. Like, I'm going to bring it, man. I have to. I have exactly. to stand up. Everybody has a different motivation. Some people just want to get better. Some people 
hate their life and this is how they take it out. And <laughs> some, some people, <laughs> some people are born mercenary awesome. killers, yeah, crazy dude. sons of bitches. Yeah. They're gonna kill everybody in the gym. Hey, all right. Exactly. But I say people, if you come in, you come in, and you look at your name on the bottom of that board. You're like tenth out of tenth. If you don't feel anything, get the fuck out of here. We don't, <laughs> we don't need your client. Yeah, hey, you're, you're listing. Or there's that one athlete that's constantly putting up the best numbers, and you say, I just want to beat that motherfucker. I'm gonna oh, do everything it takes. Yeah, yeah, but that that yeah. feeling that like, oh, I gotta do better. <laughs> Like yeah. that's what drives the progress. Like that plus a well-reasoned, simple, progressive plan. Now you got shit coming together and they can manage it with a cool tool. And or I if bet, you can scribble it on the fucking gym wall, do that. But as long as you're doing it every time, measuring and measuring. Absolutely. And I bet Meat's laughing at us. I meet the owner of Wattify saying, yeah, I thought of all this stuff, guys. But this is why we, this is why we came <laughs> up with I, it. I was genius. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I know as a coach, like I, I used to get really frustrated. I mean, I still do time to time is I tell the athletes, like, I'm not in the gym every day, and uh, I can't be there for every session. And I tell athletes, you know, especially people who are trying to be competitive, it's like, you've got to log your results, put it on the blog. You know, that's, that's where I need the results to be, on the blog. Or, you know, if you put it in your notebook, it's kind of no good to me as a coach. Sure. It's great for you as an athlete to see what's working, what's not working. And most athletes, I don't think, have the, the analytical skills or the experience necessary to, like, make good decisions based off the data. Uh, and a lot of times that's why you have a coach and a lot of times when, co you know, athletes, I'll be programming and I'll be getting results from one or two athletes. I'm supposed to be getting results from 10 athletes yeah. and they go, man, the, the workout was like, you know, I'm just getting really beat up. I'm like, are you lagging your results? And they're like, well, no, I'm like I'm not programming for you then. Like if you're not lagging results and I, as a coach can't see what's happening and, and in the numbers, then what I program is for whoever's logging results. And so I think that's, I think a lot of athletes do not see that. I mean, I know they don't, because if they did, they'd probably do a better job of logging it. Yeah. And so, you know, what, whatever, if you're an athlete out there who has a coach, get them your results and it's probably, a, make it easy on them too, because if you've got 10 athletes all handing you notebooks or here's my personal blog, here's my notebook. Oh, can you download this Excel spreadsheet? You're not going to do all that oh, shit. Oh, fuck no. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Put it on the blog. Use something like Wattify. Use like one central system is kind of like what I suggest. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of technology. It makes our life easier, simpler, and more effective. So. You can go back as long as you want and see what happened two years ago. You're not going to fucking remember that post-it note you wrote down your PR <laughs> Fran on fucking two years ago. Where are you going to stick that at? Well, no, we never forget PR Fran. That's no, no, no. no. You know, well, there's like five things you'll never forget. You yeah. know, you never forget the name. Oh, I don't know. I'll just find nuanced details across yeah, the community. Like, I, I know what my PR on snatch is. Yeah. My, my back squat, my clean and jerk, <laughs> uh, my front squat, and my Fran time. But you start asking me, like, you know, what's your Elizabeth? I go, oh, uh, yeah. I don't really remember that. But <laughs> it is important data. We just don't visit totally. it frequently enough, and we don't talk about it that often. So it's, it's good data to have, and it all kind of depends on what you're trying to improve at the To time. me, when I hear Fran, I think that's the thing that was used as a tool to make me look like an asshole at the level one as I desperately <laughs> tried to do the pull-ups. Everybody's like, ha, 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 see, CrossFit's intense. Like, yeah. yes, plenty fucking intense, bro. <laughs> as I crossed the finish line of what, like 18 minutes, 14 minutes in the fucking thing the first time I did it? Or it's the workout when you have no creativity to come up with a workout and you have, you're short on time. Like, oh, shit, what can I do? I can do some burpees. I can jump on a rower. I'll just hit out Fran real fast and get on my way. There you go. I'll call this one Chris. I'll warm up in two minutes. I'll squat to a max and go the fuck home. <laughs> <laughs> Drink a beer. It's the drive through Play, some, play <laughs> some Rush, man. <laughs> drive through style. drive through style. Yeah. Oh, that's another good way to log. It's like, uh, if you don't know what to do that day, you can just go, okay, I'm going to do whatever I did on December 10th and see if I got better at that. Go, oh, pull that open. Oh. Wait, it's an easy way to test. Like and you have a clear it, benchmark. I think a lot of times if I do that, I'll make a commitment. And like, I'm going to go back and do that workout that I, that I know I did. Or I, I don't remember it. I don't remember the workout. I'm just going to do whatever I did December 10th. Open it up, yep. and I'm like, oh, not that one. <laughs> but like I think triple Murph. I think yeah. that's the genius of the name that workouts. That sounds intense. I mean, I think that's the, the name workouts. That's what makes them so successful is that everybody knows their time, and it puts that workout up on the board. So everybody knows like their friend time and that way you can yeah. benchmark it, compare it your time. built in benchmarking. Yeah. And it goes yeah. back to chasing that data, chasing that results. <clears throat> so it's not just, you know, well, that's, that's why, what I drives mean, it. Even in powerlifting, man, even powerlifting, like in the course of a year, 
you're only thinking about what you want to aspire to, and it's usually a little too far to reach. Like, I'm gonna fucking hunt, add 100 pounds on my bench. Yeah. Well, if, especially if you're in a gym, like some random ass gym, like I'm just gonna get better at benching. And you do what you always did, and then a year later, you bench the same thing because it's you have this big pie in the sky dream yeah. and something you're shooting for. But there's nothing in between to say, right? I'm gonna build. I'm gonna build. What was it doing last yeah. month? Add X percent this month. Like no one, it's, it's such an obviously beneficial thing, and almost no one outside of this realm is doing it. Yeah, sure. Rob, what do you what do you think about like goal setting? Like I, I like what Chris just said. He's like, yeah. either I want to get better at benching, which there's no quantitative yeah. value there. We'll get and fucking then he huge. Says, and then he says a hundred pounds. <laughs> And, you know, I want to get put 100 pounds in three months. It's just ridiculous. Like, yeah. you know, what? how it, do you pr- approach goal well, setting? Well, I mean, you know, when you're running a bigger gym, I think, I think if I have to be critical and I have to think about what I can do better in my facility, I need to let my members know what, what, it, how do we even define performance? How do we define what we're doing? Um, and having them think more about performance. You know, you talked about some of the subjective stuff that kind of comes as a result mm-hmm. of the program. That's all cool. But if they're not linked into that idea that I need to get heavier weights. I need to get, you know, lower times. And again, you know, a lot of people that are coming to the program now, they, they need to be told that they need to sit them down and be like, listen, we're going to try to do better this time. And, and all those other things just kind of come with, you know, they're just add-ons. They're just, you know, condiments that come with it. So, I mean, I, you know, training condiments, training condiments, we got to fucking market <laughs> the hot somewhere. sauce of there you go. You just, I don't know why I got reminded, but I just thought of Doug and how I think the, the, the most powerful way to utilize this is not even really in the gym, but it's like when you're diet, like when we tr- help people gain weight, I they go, go on a diet, or, or to gain muscle mass. People go, okay, how to gain muscle mass? Eat a lot. Okay, I've tried that. It doesn't work. No, if you're just looking daily what you're eating and you're plotting out that daily weight and you can see it, the correlations, you can see the daily change or lack thereof, it changes everything. Like, what's that? What's that scale that you were talking about earlier? Like, you have a scale that links to an app on your phone that'll automatically graph your weight. Oh, really? Hi. What, what's, what's it called? Say it, Mike. With things or why things like W I things. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a very great marketing. Visit. Oh, it's kind of like Wi-Fi, but why things? Yeah. Things. You can got just it. hook whatever yeah, you yeah. want into Some, Wi-Fi. Somebody that's in marketing, get a hold of that company. <laughs> Tell them. To I've got the it. Name. Why <laughs> things? And yeah, anybody. No, I really am a huge fan of graphing your weight, though. Yeah. Or just I just wanted to interrupt. Like anybody that is trying to gain weight, I'm sure you guys know all too well about this. It always comes down to... Don't look at me when you say that. Uh, You're talking about it. I'm sure you know a lot about gaining weight, right? Am I right? (laughs) We're trying to get an athlete who wants to gain weight and put on muscle. What do they always say? (laughs) You're right, by the way. I know a lot about gaining weight. for the throat. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm eating. I'm eating all day long. They write it down, and you find out they're not eating nearly as much as they should. Subjectivity. Mm, Totally. They're eating corn chips. (laughs) You know what? You can pot your weight and be like, I know what kind of things I need to be eating. I need to amp it up, and no matter how much I feel like I'm going to fucking die, until that thing that trajectory comes up and that the trend line is going in the right direction usually yep. people don't they think i'm eating a lot oh, until you see the scale move keep eating exactly <laughs> then you got it right how yep. many how I, many goals do you guys like to set at a time like do you guys like pick one goal and attack that one thing you set three goals because i've heard some people say we do one goal at a time some people say we do three goals at a time is this strictly fitness related health yeah, related yeah, yeah, yeah. well i mean <laughs> So usually, well, yeah, I mean, just I, everything in like business, I'll set a goal. You know, fitness wise, of course, I'll set a goal. Um, you know, right now, I guess where I'm at personally, not. I, I know you guys don't care too much where I'm at personally, but I don't care, I, man. I care. We have an maybe, internet connection already, homie. <laughs> listen, like some of this. You know, depending, maybe a year ago, I was into the competition side. I was tracking everything. Now, my goal is to get a gr- good workout and to stay in shape. So I focused uh, everything in my business into the gym. So now the performance tracking is not as important right now to me at this point in my life. For you. For me. Yeah. So my goals are a little more broad. Yeah, and that's more, fine. Yeah, just, just where I'm at right now. You know, I want to stay in shape. I want to continue to be a role model and an example to the kids that I work with. What if, you're, what if your friend time increased by 50%? Would that be a red flag? On your would fitness? your ego flare up? Say, would, fuck would you, this. Like, oh, I, need to, I need to reassess <laughs> I <think so>. my <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a whole, yeah. I think I could zero on that. That's a whole other goal setting lesson, I think, is that people think I'm going to crush business, right? Fucking high five, man. I'm going to crush that thing, my family life. I'm going to crush the games. Basically, I'm going to crush everything that's important in my life simultaneously. Well, good for you if you're like 21 and shot out of a fucking cannon and you're, you're ready to go and you feel no pain. Yeah. You get to be 30, 40, and you got a really complicated life, kids and job, and you can't give yourself all the way to everything at one time. It's a basic yeah. lesson of periodization. You have to sequence something. You have to give something to take something else. I couldn't agree yeah. more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You got to like, start focusing. 
I'm sorry. I feel like information and data overload is like one of the biggest problems in in society right now. Like uh, in the book, The Power of Less by Leo Babauta, I think that is, they they quote a study where they had people um, either set one, two or three goals at the same time. And all the people that were able to focus and only set one goal were like 85% successful at the end of the month of actually keeping Mm -hmm. or being on track with with completing that one specific goal. I think the people that did two goals at one time, like 45% of the people were still on track. And then the people that did three goals at the same time were like 5% of them were still on track or something like that. So I think being able to focus on one single thing is really is the track to actually getting something done. Because if you set three goals and you accomplish none of them, well, then you set zero goals, really. Wait, I'm sorry. What did you say? I wasn't focusing. (laughs) <laughs> this guy, you see what I did there? He's, he's got jokes. I can also say, I can also say it like this: is down home, like country way. If you got one ass, don't ride two horses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, I read that somewhere. It's like I think it's a Hungarian saying. I don't know why I said that, but it's true. But honestly, I think it's a very critical point. Part of this discussion is it's easy to get distracted, whether it's fitness, totally. your own personal goals, and especially now with technology, you know, it is easy to get distracted when you're in the gym, you're checking your Facebook in the middle of a workout. You're oh, yeah. tweeting, you're checking your emails. <laughs> I mean, everybody's guilty of it. You know, everybody's busy and everybody's important. So I got a text here, text there. I forget who I'm even talking to right now. My head's not looking up. Yeah, mindfulness you know, I think it's a real, is lacking. It's a real issue. I mean, it's a whole nother, I'm probably going off on a tangent here. Yeah. But I was just having no, this no, conversation. No, 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 man. It's, it's very relevant because people show, think, I'm passionate, passionate about it. You got to think carefully <laughs> about, you got to think, like, like most people will buy apps and shit to their phone. How many times... Do most of those apps get used yeah. after the first, oh, this is cool, look at all this shit I can do, and you never leave it, you never touch it again? That's the promise of technology. Like in the 30s and 40s, they said, by the year 2000, what will we do with all of our spare time when we have computers to run our lives? Yeah. The answer, you work fucking 10 times harder to have la- half the pleasure in your life. That's what happens if you don't respect the tools. Now, this is a tool, it doesn't replace anything you have to do to organize your own life. It just helps you if you, use it, if you use the tool for what a tool's for. Amen. Yeah, speaking of tools, I think the clock really is one of the best tools in the gym because once the clock starts, doing something like checking your email on your phone or your Facebook or, or having a, a casual conversation with somebody, all that shit goes away because the clock's running. So me and Mike a while back, we were trying to explain to, to business owners, we were doing a time management and productivity type talk, mm-hmm. and we're trying to explain to business owners that you should use that same concept in your own daily life. Like if you want to actually do something productive in your email or you're working on a project or whatever, you should AMRAP that time, start the clock, AMRAP 30 minutes working on your presentation or whatever the hell you're doing and you're not checking social media, you're not you're not going to the bathroom, you're not getting a drink of water, you're not doing anything. You're just working on that one sole thing for 30 minutes. You can crush like three hours of work in 30 minutes because you're actually focused for once. There's a great uh, classic article in the journal called Tabata My Job. Oh, and really? Yeah, the guy talks oh. just about that same thing and he broke his day up. I don't remember the article he specifically, but yeah, <laughs> he broke it up like that and he would hit it hard and then he would fool around for 10 minutes or whatever, but he got a ton of stuff done. Master- yeah. Masturbation, masturbation for 10 minutes, right? That's it. <laughs> time for that. Fool around. <laughs> for me, one of the biggest breakthroughs was when I stopped, I turned my email off when it just constantly comes in, but I set it to where I hit send and receive. So it comes in only when I'm looking at it. So I set a time, X amount of time, a block. That's brilliant. For yeah. that day. It sounds simple, but it really changes everything. Because then you have all this extra time to do things that really matter. More mm-hmm. creative stuff, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, working on the business. So just being there, being reactive to the emails. You're present too, because you're actually doing it for a straight hour. You, yep. You've yeah. got all the distractions out of the way. And you get in that flow state where you're not thinking about, because multitasking is, I mean, I'm not yeah. saying it's bullshit, but like, it's just not, a very sustainable thing. <laughs> yeah, it's not, I mean, it, it, you, you can do things at the same time with like easy things, but anything that's going to make a real change in your life, anything mm-hmm. that really matters deserves your fucking attention. Yeah. I learned that lesson really hard this year. We opened yeah. a second uh, a second facility and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I have two kids and I'm trying to have a social life and stuff and boy, it's, I mean. It's a struggle, man. It's really, it's really tough. So yeah. And it's such an easy that, thing to huge. say, right? Like you go, I have I know what's important. I gotta keep this here, and when I get home, I'm gonna pay attention to my kids and be present yeah. with them. And then you feel, it's just like anything else, you feel the reality of it hits you, like you're playing with your kid and you feel your, your fucking, <laughs> b- b- your phone buzz in your pocket, you go, ah, that Pavlovian response. Yeah. I gotta, that could be somebody at work asking yeah. me things that I must jump on now or else yep. I don't know why. <laughs> and then just like that, like a vapor, you're fucking back on the bad track. I struggle with that more than anything. I keep in the fucking boundaries drawn. It takes constant daily effort for sure. Can you switch my phone to do what you just said? Can I, if I give it to you? Turn uh, a note of- we can talk about it. All right. <laughs> it only, it only checks the email when you hit a button, huh? That was a test. Yeah. He's like, not right so, now. I'm right, podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> Almost everything I have on my phone is disabled most of the time. Like, yeah, you know, all I, push the, notifications. Do not, do turn disturb, it off. Yeah. Do not disturb is enabled most of the time. People get mad at me sometimes. They're like, 
are you screening my calls? I'm like, nah, I'm screening everybody's calls. <laughs> I just yeah, read I, the four hour work week. I don't check email no more. That's fuck yeah. you. <laughs> One of my buddies right. just got in you. You ever had a VA? Hmm? You ever had a VA? Assistant. No, no. I read the book and I, I, yeah, it's an interesting concept, but I think that's too, that's too detached for me right now. I'm yeah. sorry. What book I, was I like it? The, the other 5% of that book though, which basically just says, you know, you, you know, you, you, you got to try and trim down and, I like his approach. Yeah. I always like 5% of his books. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that, that's funny you say that because that's exactly right. Like, if you view it as a, a book purely on efficiency, the four hour work week specifically, then it's a really good book. If you take it all too literally, it might be a little bit too far out there for some people. Yeah. Not that it's not possible, but maybe too much for some people. But, but you're exactly right. I feel like, especially the four hour body, I'm. Um, when I read that, I was like, I thought that was really good, but I think I think that I think that I thought that was really good because I have a filter already. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if you don't know anything about fitness, then you might take some of these things that are really little tiny pieces of of information that aren't even close to the big picture and take it too far yeah. and uh, then you, not get results because you're not focusing on the big rock, so to speak. You confuse right. a sugar yeah. rush with something that's a full meal, kind of. Like, it's supposed to give you a spark and get you thinking, but it's not like, it's not the only way to get what you want. It's like, it gets you moving. It gets you thinking. Yeah. That's all. All that being said, Tim Ferriss is like one of my favorite authors of all time. So I'm not saying. Oh yeah, no, we're not. This is not talking shit at all. This is this is clear. I won't. That's my opinion. Then I'll hold back. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think he's a marketing marketing genius. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's probably what he would tell you. Is I say he's also a marketing genius. I think he's a genius at a lot of things. I don't know. Oh, he's holding back again. (laughs) (laughs) I think I think I think he he does he conducts a case study on himself and then he tells everyone else that maybe they should try it on themselves. But, yeah. I, I, you know, I think people need to recognize it as case studies on himself the same way people shouldn't take any research and apply it to everything. So. Yeah, I don't think Tim claims to be a fitness guy. So that's I don't think that's part of his whole deal, but definitely a marketing and business genius man for sure. Yeah, in all fairness to him, he does surround himself with people like I think, you know, Brian McKenzie has done some stuff with him and uh, Mark Bell for Paddle. He, he reaches yeah. out to people he knows, understands it better than him and he packages it the way as damn sexy. Well, back back he's to the, what you had said. I mean, you know, he's trying to make himself into his own laboratory. And what right. other tool? I mean, other than measure, you know, measurement, it needs to be measurable, observable, repeatable. Back to performance tracking. Yeah. And if you wanted to take one of his ideas and you implement it, well, you know, where are your numbers? Well, how, how did it work? If yeah. it worked, great. Fuck. Yeah. yeah, I do think the only the only drawback to some of his stuff. I mean, I think it's more for intermediate or advanced. Somebody that has already kind of experimented and tried different things on themselves. Mm-hmm. Sometimes for the beginner, I think it kind of sends a message that he's looking for hacks and looking for, mm-hmm. lack yes. of a better word, a shortcut, and you can kind of like hack the system and kind of figure out different yeah. things. It's alluring to people. That, that, that sells yeah. very well though. Hacks and shortcuts and tips like and little things like that. that and that's great. why he's a marketing genius because uh, he figured right. out what people yeah. want and that's what he puts but in But you spot. can that's hack exactly it, right. Steve, if you'd only consider making a donkey meat paleo kit, <laughs> <laughs> that that's would right. sell like wildfire. the first fun. on the market. Well, if you put a little cinnamon and a little lemon in your water, then all of a sudden your abs start showing. And that's is that the, true? That's the true hack. How much cinnamon do I need? <laughs> I'm thinking a lot of cinnamon. I have to. I haven't read the book in a while. It was something along those lines. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 So that, that, those are the little pieces I'm talking about that you can take them too far and miss the big picture if you're not if you don't have a, a filter already. Welcome back to Technique Quad. Today's video is all about the, the first pull of the snatch. I'm Doug Larson with the Barbell Shrug Podcast. This is Alex Macon. He's one of our faction and barbell slur- slugged barbell slugged. <laughs> <laughs> he's one of our faction and barbell shrugged weightlifting coaches, and he's also one of the coaches in the six month muscle gain challenge. Uh, so, uh, first, we'll let Alex pull a full snatch just so you can get an idea uh, of what we're looking at today. There you go. So, uh, if, we, if we let Alex go through uh, the full snatch movement, or at least the pull in slow motion, I'm going to break down where the starting position is, where the first pull is, where the transition is, and where the, the second or the explosive part of the pull is is. So go ahead and do a, a slow motion pull. So right now it's getting into the starting position. Again, perfect starting position here. First pull, nice and slow. It's pushing these knees back, stop right there. That's pretty much the extent of the first pull. Maybe a little bit longer, go a little bit longer. Right when he starts to re-bend his knees and push his knees under the bar, that's the transition. And then when he goes to re-extend his knees and, and pull and shrug uh, the weight and to put it overhead, that's really the second pull. It's the explosive part of the movement. So today we're going to focus on the first pull only. Again, we've already done a video on the starting position. So if you want to, if you want the details about how to get into a perfect start position, we have a video on that already made. So I'm, re- I'm going to refer you to that video. For the first pull, if Alex goes, go ahead and get into a good starting position, we're going to talk about the details of the first pull. 
There you go. Beautiful. So basically, again, the first pull is from the floor. And while you're extending your knee, once your knee starts to rebend, and then you're not in the first pull anymore. Beautiful. So, again, if he's here, my knee is bent. He straighten, 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 straighten. The second my knee starts to rebend a little bit, when I try to get into my power position, before I come here and I, I get that triple extension and I start to shrug, that's all transition and second pull stuff. Today we're talking about just the first pull. So here's how to do it correctly. Go and do it one more time. You can see Alex gets into a good starting position, and then as the bar comes off the ground, he keeps his posture, arm stays straight, butt stays down. Beautiful. All right, one more time. Look at the angle of his back. The angle of his back is going to stay pretty consistent the whole time. Uh, what he's not doing, go and do a stripper snatch where your butt pops up. So what he's not doing is having his, his butt pop up like this. See how his butt popped up first and his back kind of came all the way flat where it was almost parallel to the ground. Uh, you're not going to have very good leverage like that throughout the rest of the movement, especially in your transition and your second pull. It might be easier off the floor maybe, but your, your second pull is not going to be as powerful, especially once it gets heavy. It's going to throw you forward and you're going to miss the lift in front of you. Uh, so that's one big thing. Uh, is having your butt pop up too quickly. So go ahead and again show one good rep where your butt doesn't pop up. So this is how it's supposed to look. Watch his hips. They stay below his shoulders. So good starting position. There you go. Now when he gets into that, to that transition second pull position, he's up here and he's not all the way bent over. Uh, so that's, that's a good job with keeping your hips down. Also, we want to, at the, I'll demo this one myself. Right here, we want to be at least mid-foot heavy, and then as we stand through the, sec through the first pull, rather, we want to be rocking towards our heels. We want to be very heel heavy at the top of the first pull. So Alex, go ahead and demo that. I want you to, it's hard to see, but you're going to look at, his, at the center of pressure on his feet. He's not toe heavy. He's, his hips are back, and he's very heel heavy when he gets to the top of that first pull. And that's going to make the bar come into him as it comes off the ground. So he's very heel heavy there. Beautiful. Where he doesn't want to be is he doesn't want to push through the middle of his foot and end up on his toes. He comes forward like that, which is super hard to see. But right now, the center of pressure is about right here instead of being back there. And what's going to happen is... What's going to happen is, is he's going to pick it up, he's going to be here, and since my pressure is on my toes, when I go to transition, everything comes forward and then I drop the weight in front of me. So as you uh, go through the first pull, your weight should be going from midfoot to very heel heavy. That way when you transition, everything's coming into you and you pull and the bar's coming over the top of you and you're not chasing out in front of you. You notice that as Alex pulls the bar off the ground, his knees stay out. He even gets into that little bit of a diamond shape with his legs and his knees don't wobble in. So do a good one, a bad one, and then a good one again. So watch his knees. His knees stay out the whole time. Beautiful, just like that. They don't wobble towards the inside as it comes off the floor. There you go. Can you, can you wobble really bad one time? There you go. That was pretty bad. Uh, here's, here would be a bad example if someone was here. You see this all the time where people, they come off the ground and then their knees go in like that. You don't want your knees to flop in and out like that. Okay. So I'm here. My knees stay out. In fact, this would be a full first pull right, right to about there. My knees don't do is they don't go like this. Okay. So knees out the whole time, just like squatting or deadlifting or any other movement where you're pressing on the ground. So two more great points. Uh, one is keeping the bar close to you, and one is speed off the floor. You can see how close the bar is to Alex without actually touching him. The bar doesn't want to touch him until it hits him on his hips, or maybe upper thigh. There you go. Bar was super close the whole time. If you look at the bar path, the bar is coming into him the whole time. His knee is over the bar, and then as he stands, as he stands, he's pushing his knees back, and the bar is coming into him. It's coming back into him, so he's pushing his knees back out of the way of the bar, and the bar is coming into him. What he's not doing is staying tall and moving the bar around his knees. So you never want to, you never want to lean back and move the bar around your knees like that. 
You always want to push your knees back away from the, away from the bar. Okay, last thing was speed off the floor. Basically, the point of the first pull is to put you in a good position for your second pull. And so a lot of times, if you're, especially if you're used to um, pulling like speed deadlifts or you're used to lifting off the floor as fast as possible, you might lift too quickly during your first pull and it screws you up and puts you out of position for your second pull. So your first pull can be a little bit slower than you could pick it up off the ground, but you want to do it only as fast as you can where you're staying in a good position, which basically for the most part means keeping your butt down. So sometimes people will pull too fast and end up doing the stripper snaps like we showed you earlier where your butt pops up too quickly. Go and do like a, a bad fast first pull where your butt pops up too quick. Come on, man. Pop it's, the butt up. it's hard to do it raw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That was pretty good. Start saying that's pretty bad because we're confused people. Yeah. That was pretty good at being bad. <laughs> so that was a bad snatch. Your butt popped up too quick. Okay. So now slow down your first pull a little bit, keep your butt down, do a perfect first pull. There you go, beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna exaggerate some of these things just uh, in case you can't see that. Here would be a good first pull. Again, my butt stays down. Look at my back angle. I'm here where my back angle stayed the same basically the whole time. And then a bad, for the example we're talking about right now, would be where my butt comes way up and then I pick it up, okay? Was that super exaggerated? It probably looked more like this, like that, where my butt came up and then I tried to get into a good power position where the bar connects with my hips. Um, so a little more exaggerated just so you can see it. The point is, is you want to keep a consistent back angle on your first pull. That way when you go to your second pull, it's only a small transition from basically there to there and you're not all the way bent over when you go to try to do your second pull. <sighs> we missed anything? Nope. The way you describe is exactly how John North snatches. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. He does have that super ramp. I can just see the trolls now. <laughs> it's like, but John North is super ramp pull. <laughs> like, that's exactly what he does. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Uh, there's a lot of variation, but for the most part, at least when you're first getting started, stick with doing it somewhat like this. As you become an expert, you can tweak it and make it your own, but this is, this, this is kind of the foundation of the first pull for the moment. So uh, we'll do another video on the transition, which is the, the phase following the first pull in a, in a separate video. If you want to check out that video, you can go to bobbleshrug.com and click on Technique Wad, and that video will be in the library. Um, off of Tim Ferriss for a moment. Like, do you have a team right now for Steve's Club? Like, are you doing all that all by yourself, or do you guys you have any support? I wish I was doing all by myself. No, I wish. So it is a I club. A lot of people. <laughs> so you, yeah. you you hate people? That's what I heard. Hate people? Yeah, you're, you're, that's you pretty said, accurate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I got a nonprofit where I don't talk to anybody except for under, <laughs> underprivileged children. He loves them. Uh, Wait, no, so, so tell tell us a little bit more about Steve's Club for all the people that don't know. I mean, I know you mentioned okay. it at the very beginning, but I, I'd like to hear more about it. Oh yeah, I'd love to talk about it. So we get kids uh, from Camden, New Jersey, who was who are they're recently ranked the most dangerous city in the country. So it's not a is it true? Is it is that you walk in the streets? You're like I gotta hold on to shit and get get undercover soon. Like is it really that dangerous? I think well, Zach we are ten about ten minutes away. So after we get done this, we could take you take a, a field tour. trip. Absolutely. Now, this it looks really so bad. Is. Run, run, run! <laughs> <laughs> it's a different world. A wild, yeah. wild west. A lot of cops don't go down. A lot of streets. Oh it's shit! Bad. Yeah. Wow. It's a if cops are scared, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's truly bad. But mm -hmm. I, I got to meet a lot of kids, and they truly are really good kids. You know, I had a lot of stereotypes and made a lot of assumptions before I went in there, thinking a lot of these kids were punks and thugs and mm -hmm. yeah, trying to make a quick buck selling on the corner. Mm -hmm. a lot, I got to meet a lot of kids, and they were kind of reminding me of myself growing up, athletes. They're trying to get ahead, trying to make the right decisions, mm -hmm. but just the environment they grew up in just didn't make yeah, it easy. Yeah, that's what breaks my heart because – it's so easy if somebody said, oh, yeah, look at this situation. It's so tragic. If everybody's got their heads together, they come up with a solution. It's, yeah, okay. But to, be, to find your consciousness to, be, to, to bloom in that environment when you had no fucking choice, you're just a kid trying desperately to survive, Absolutely. trying to plot a, a, you know, see a path forward for yourself when there's nobody around you saying a fucking thing positive to you ever. Like, you could go to school? Shit, man, you're plenty smart. No one says that to you. What do you do if you're a kid who doesn't hear that? You try to look for sports. Like, there are kids doing their best. I think yep. it's amazing 
that people can take their time to support a young kid getting a crack at things. I mean, if there's anything worth supporting, it's supporting a fucking kid to take a shot that he knows down inside he's maybe capable of, but no one is telling him it's possible, even though it's completely possible. I told you you should come over to Steve's Club, give a little talk. I would love that, that man. Fuck, I would love it. I agree a hundred percent. People need to know that people like, yep, yeah, you, you you have everything within you to do amazing shit right now. You Absolutely. Are, like people say in India, in India they say Namaste for a reason. That means you you recognize the divine spark in another human being. You fucking got it. Absolutely. You and have it. You all and have that's it. That's the message that we constantly send. And I don't, I, I can't say it enough. And I sound like a broken record. And the kids know they're tired of hearing me. But it's working hard. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. You work hard. You can get things you want in life. You know, you don't have to be a celebrity. You don't have to be a professional athlete to have what you want to to provide for your family. You can work hard, get a good job, go to college, and you can make things happen on your own. Do you ever tell them, hey, man, look, I know, fuck, you, you got a, a short straw here. You're here, but this does not mean you have to stay here. Do you ever say, look, it's fucking tough, but you guys are tough. Look, you could, you're surviving. If you can make it out of here, you can make it fucking anywhere. And that's why it's probably my passion. That's why I love it so much because they don't complain and they don't look at it like that. They, they just look ahead, they look forward, and they're trying yeah. to make the right thing so they don't feel bad, it's not poor me. If I anything, never hear that. If anything, I'd say they're probably more on the edge of being alive and fucking vivacious and awesome because anytime humans get put in a situation where they're on the edge and fear is real and the, the risk of injury and death is really fucking real, that's what something inside the human spirit gets ignited. Like the opposite, the most pathetic person is the guy who has nothing pushing them, nothing straining them, no real risk in life. They just sit somewhere and go down a path that's numbing and comfortable and that's, it opens up on its own to them. That is the worst example of a human I can think, I can think of. There's, there's great people who, can, who do that, but it's not what makes a special human that is resilient and fucking stands up and does Absolutely. shit that really changes the world. And honestly, yeah, part of it's being selfish. They inspire me because they're battling adversity. They're making, they're not giving everything. They're making things happen. And yeah. it constantly reminds me of, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kyle, Kyle Maynard. Kyle yes. Maynard? Yeah, 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 so he's, yeah. One of my, yeah. he's one of my heroes. I love that guy. I love his videos. I'm always <sighs> showing him what he does to the kids at Steve's Club, saying sometimes, you know, this is what you're dealt. You know, maybe you might not have what you want, but you can, you don't let that kind of become who you are. You can make the rules. You can make things happen on your own. Yeah, we gotta, I got to meet Kyle, man. Just like, holy right. shit, what excuse am I fucking holding on to? <laughs> you, guys, you guys have 18 uh, other... I guess locations or clubs, at, at clubs, and so in different cities in the United States. Yeah, are they all in the U.S.? All in the United States. Um, so we have a lot of gym owners, um, namely CrossFit gym owners. They don't have to be CrossFit, um, but they come forward. They want to help out in their local community, and we make it as easy as we can for them to start a youth program. So it doesn't have to be a big, elaborate nonprofit program. You could start small. You could start working with two kids. If you have a nice gym like this CrossFit One Force you could bring in two or three kids mm-hmm. from the neighborhood kids that can't afford CrossFit but that could greatly benefit from it that change get, your life dude it really is I mean I've seen it firsthand. it's life changing you said mm-hmm. you, you, you took emphasis off of um, yourself and your metrics and your performance I guess you were taking performance pretty seriously what was you were you yeah. doing CrossFit and none, any other sports just CrossFit mainly you yeah know, competing. so isn't it amazing once you get on the other side you think you're giving up something to focus on something else but once you can take that energy and put it towards another person and you watch them become better than you like once you do that and you feel that I think you realize that's really much more of a special thing oftentimes like yeah. I get addicted to that I, I don't give a shit about my performance anymore really yeah. I look at people achieve something because I gave them a pearl and they, they oh it really it helped me a lot I go absolutely fuck man I'm humbled by that thank you I mean, it feels I gained, better yeah. it does and I gain so much seeing other athletes you know benefit and the, the kids get benefit and get better not only performance outside the gym then I have not that I did on anything great in competition wise but then the reward mm. of Common, you know, completing a competition, doing well. I mean, that's that doesn't even compare. Yeah. You know, seeing that somebody else do bet good, that's kind of what motivates me. Have you had that clear playing lesson where you you saw a kid who you could clearly say, "There's a good chance, better than not, this kid will be in jail or dead." And does it happen oftentimes where this kid bounces back as good in sports and makes it into a school or makes it out and gets a good job? I mean, how often does this happen? I mean, I, I imagine it must be the most powerful thing you can experience to actually have that effect. It really is. I mean, the biggest thing, so we've been doing it since 2006. So we had a, we had a, a several years now to kind of see the results, mm-hmm. see kids go through the program. Um, and it really has, it's been amazing. Between kids will come in, and the biggest thing is the attitude. Mm-hmm. You know, you come in, you see a kid just with a bad attitude. And that's, you know, in a nonprofit world, similar to the conversation we're having, they go by metrics. 
Yeah. So if you're looking to get funded, they want to see metrics. They want to see a kid. Okay, tell me they had D's and now they have A's. Graduation and rates and therefore I'll write you a check for a grant. So the metric for me has always been their attitude, has been seeing their behavior, the choices they make. That's the metric for me. And I've seen kids go from I don't really have options and And they feel wounded and defensive and defensive and I'll do what I I'll do what I ever I want to do. This mm-hmm. is me and this is the life I'm living. Screw you. Fuck it. To change it to <laughs> yeah. yeah, how can I be a part of this? How can I to volunteer and to kind of take advantage Fuck, of all the, the services? Most powerful thing in the world. It really is. A kid that you would think like, there's no way getting through to this kid. He already kind of he already is who he is. So awesome, seeing man. that happen has been yeah. How do you find that kid? You're basically taking these kids off the streets, the same streets that cops won't go down. Yeah. Like how do you get that kid? And are you getting <laughs> resistance from well, from their their parents or their you know whoever's taking care of them at the time? Like how does that work? Well, the biggest thing I think it works, and this is this applies to anything, is it's the person on the other end has to want to do it. So they raise their hand, they make a decision. Their friend tells, so they hear it from their friend. They hear about Steve's Cub, so they come in. So. I'm not going out there and saying you have to come here. There's no probation officer saying you have to come to Steve's club. They come here because they choose to. So, I mean, I think that quote up there on the wall, this place will change you if you let it. So I think that says it all. They have to make that decision that they're willing to be changed. So these kids come in here with an open mind. Hey, you guys have been doing this since 2006. And uh, you guys are looking to grow? Grow as in... Maybe uh, more clubs. You want to yes. So we're clubs? always looking for so if more. Someone's interested in that. What, how do they do that? Good question. Yes. Yeah, so if somebody's interested, they can go to our website, stevesclub.org, and we have resources on there. Of we have an application. They could email us. I mean, we pretty much set up the national program to help people start a youth program, so they're not getting involved in the whole nonprofit. Uh, the business side of it, we want them to work with the kids. So we figure that part out, and we just want to see. We want to see the concept grow because we've seen firsthand what it does. And you said at the beginning that Steve's Paleo Goods kind of helps fund that. Yeah, so Steve's Paleo Goods, shortly after starting Steve's Club, we put some beef jerky, nuts and berries in a bag to help mm-hmm. the kids eat better. They're, they kept coming back to me saying, how am I supposed to get fit and get better if I have all this junk food in the cafeteria? There's nothing to eat. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, we gave them some beef jerky. They loved it. We put it up for sale. And now it has grown since then. Um, we are now in... 35 Whole Foods, you know, we sell our stuff oh, to really? gyms awesome. all over the country. Wow. Yeah, it's going really well, and that supports our national program. So, our national program is solely supported by Steve's Pelly Goods. Very nice. Fantastic. Cool. So, I'm out of That's breath. Right. That's enough. This is the most ever <laughs> talked about me. Thank you guys for allowing me to do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic, man. Rob, is there anything you want to promote before we uh, shut this thing down? No, I got, I got nothing. Um, if you live maybe in your hometown, maybe you should visit one of your CrossFit boxes. Yeah, I got two CrossFit gyms, um, CrossFit Delaware Valley and CrossFit Harmony. Uh, I share Harmony with Amy Lyons. She's my partner on that one. She runs one of the big gyms in the area. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're just we're just interested in evangelizing CrossFit and showing it to new people. I mean, it's a similar feeling. I was listening to him talk about kids, and it's kind of, for me, it's the same thing when somebody comes in and they don't, you know, they're look over at the pull-up bar like, oh, I don't think I'll ever get there, but, you know, I'll try some other stuff. And then we come and check back in on them in three months and they got their first pull up. I mean, there's nothing better than that. Yeah. So, you know, with all the traveling and stuff and the work that we do with two gyms, just, it's great. I, I, I mean, that's, that's why we do it. And Rob's downplaying a little. He runs an awesome gym. He has a great reputation. Area. He really does. <laughs> Rob, before so, you go, big guy. sexy, big sexy, I have a question <laughs> yes. uh, for the 2014 open. What advice do you have for Rich? If he has a shot, a shot in the dark at repeating again, what do you? What's the one thing you think will really push him over the top? Rich Froning. Rich Froning. The Rich Froning. The Rich. What should he do? Yeah. What should he do? Jeez, he should he should eat a lot of paleo paleo kids, <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> Listen to a lot of Cana- Rush. Canadian trio. Canadian Rush. Canadian prog rock is what you recommend. For sure. Fuck, I, I recommend yeah. that too. Tom Sawyer, Spirit of Radio. You get what you want. Twenty one twelve on repeat. <laughs> no, Rich. I mean, he's so good. Jeez. But, you know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, just a quick detour. I mean, how these regionals will play out this year, it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. It's a grand experiment. Yeah. You think they're going to switch it up for the Open this year, make it interesting? Or do you think we're going to see the, uh, the typical Open from the last three years? 
Uh, I think they'll keep, well I mean I think they'll keep it the same just because I think the the open's designed to be an inclusive thing but uh, you know th- that's the great thing about the open workouts we have retried those back to performance track and we've retried those open workouts recently we've redone a bunch of them and there's just something magical about those you know lighter weights even like 75 pound barbell you look at it and you're like oh man. no big deal <laughs> but if you want to get all those rounds you're going to have to go to that place and yes. uh, I love that about the open um, I also love trying to get those new people you know and get them to do the open is just fantastic because they push themselves way harder than they ever would. Um, we had one of our coaches talking about it in the gym today, like why people should do do the open. And until you've done it, you can't get your head wrapped around how cool it is. Uh, we run it on Friday nights in our gym. We have a big party afterwards. Big, you know, that's awesome. Chicken wings for everybody. Yeah. Chicken wings. Chicken wings. Okay, oh, I'm, yeah. I might go to that place. Yeah, <laughs> Thunderbird Pizza, Brumal PA. Yeah, chicken uh, wings. It's all. About I love that. the saying is, uh, I think I saw one commercial somewhere. You know, prove it. Like. You say whatever you want. Step up and prove it. This is yeah. for you too. And you go, I could totally fuck it. I could fucking go to that thing. I'm fit. I play college ball. All right. Get into the place and yeah. go, uh, yeah, I'll leave this for these guys. <laughs> <laughs> this, this place is not fun. No. I think for Rich, though, just one last thing, one last point I'll add. I mean, the videos I watched on him, I, I think the biggest thing is the workouts one before he even shows up. I mean, his uh, the amount of workouts, his schedule, his training routine, his eating habits now, I mean, everything, it's all dialed in. So he's doing everything in the off season. And then yeah. when it's time to show up, it's just a workout for him. I yeah. think when you go, I mean, not many people have this luxury, but when we went, I, I had those thoughts. So I'm like, yeah, Rich, yeah, maybe he's lucky. Maybe this is not the year, whatever. And you go see him, you just see him train. You watch the guy do, I think that first workout I saw him do live was doing endless rounds of thrusters or push presses and then some ski erg stuff. I go, oh, wow. And he's been doing it for God knows how long. And I turn around and say hello to somebody. I turn back around. He looks like he just got out of bed. He's instantly recovered. <laughs> and the way he carries himself during the whole day in his hometown, small scene, no one's looking at him like he's in anything. And he doesn't conduct himself like he's that guy. Yeah. He's focused. He's calm. He's balanced. He's present. It's everything you need in addition to great programming to equal. Now, if I had that attitude, I still don't win the CrossFit Games, but it goes a long way to making it possible. Is that me vibrating? Yeah, I'm wondering who that is. You blew out your microphone, Chris. Oh, just unplug it. It's driving me nuts. That happened once before in San Francisco, didn't it? Yeah. It's worse. It's, there we go. But it is funny. It's like the average person wants to know what's that one thing they're doing. You know, is mm. Michael Jordan, is it because of the shoes? Is it because the milk he's drinking? That's what propelled him to that level. Is it the compulsive like, gambling? All those yeah. things are the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ouch. sure maybe Tim Ferriss is working on a book for that one thing that athlete does. You, yeah, you follow it and he's going to be a superstar. Yeah. But yeah. Mm-hmm. there's so many factors at play and it's ultimately it comes down to hard work. He's, I'm sure, working harder. Not just as hard, but harder than anybody out there. I think, I think like... Uh, Maybe kind of talking about Tim Ferriss and like tweaking those little things. Sometimes that's what makes, that's what an athlete needs to believe to get them to work hard. Sure. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I've definitely been on like maybe supplement protocols where I took my training more seriously. So I don't want to waste the money on these supplements I've been buying. So I'm going to train harder. <laughs> yeah. When it might not have been that I was taking more creatine, you know, yeah. it might have been that I knew I was taking more creatine. So I should probably work harder. And sure. Then, so, placebo. You know, yeah. Even a, a even a shitty there. program well followed is going to be better than That's you know, right. You got to yeah. believe in what you're doing. I think that's the most important. Yeah. Thing. They're all like cogs in the wheel. If you have one thing maximized and well thought out, great. Good for you. Your programming is as perfect as you can make it. What else? Oh, what else is there? Uh, belief, diet, sleep, rest, nutrition, uh, <laughs> presentness, mindfulness. I mean, all this shit. Yeah. <laughs> that is just as powerful. It's like those things that you 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 feel once you do start measuring things and realize it's the dedication to measuring like that that repetition, that act, that, that commitment that makes it happen. Not just the act of writing a number down and following numbers. Those numbers are just fucking numbers, man. It's the, the behaviors that make it happen. The habits, the conditions, they all change. Yeah. All right. I'm going to shut this thing down. Uh, I want to thank CrossFit One Force for letting us come into their facility and podcast. I want to thank uh, Amit from Wattify for That's making great. this connection. We were coming to New Jersey and we were like, hey, who can we talk to? Yeah. And he, uh, he, brought up y'all's names and we decided to come hang out with some jersey boys and, and oh. have some fun uh, i do want to promote wattify a little bit i'm going to talk about performance tracking we use wattify in our box you guys use yep. uh wattify in y'all's box and I, I think we could all agree it's probably the best way for a gym to track performance so. absolutely 
And I think we, I want to do some Steve's Club things. We should go hang out at an event and talk. And I think, I think we might do that this afternoon. We're going to see if we can squeeze that in the schedule. <laughs> if not today, very soon. Yes. All right. Uh, make sure to go to barbellshrug.com, sign up for the newsletter, and we can uh, send you virtual hugs. Maybe we'll sh- send you a video where you'll learn about the uh, snatch mistakes you might be making that are keeping you from hitting your next PR. See you next time. <laughs> Cheers. Thank Thanks, you. guys. That was fun, eh? That yeah. was great. Well Sorry done. for the, the mic vibrations. <laughs> I figured out this had me. Wow, it was a blast. What ends yeah. up happening is that was really fun. Like yeah, thanks really for the uh, the invite.